So let's talk about kefir. So I'm, I'm imagining a lot of you guys are here to learn how to make kefir or kombucha, fermented vegetables. Am I right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, kefir. Kefir is one of my favorites. It was one of, like, one of the earliest products that I started to incorporate. I really found about it through Gaps and Natasha Campbell McBride. And um, I start, I, again, I just started making kefir. It's so easy. It only takes around 24 hours to make. Really simple, short ferment. Kefir grains. There's two different types. We've got milk kefir here. You can pass this way. And then we've got water kefir over here. Pass it there. So very, very different cultures. So we'll start with milk kefir. Milk kefir, for my research, I, I believe it came through the Mongolians, through the Mongols. The Mongols were horse tribes. And so, yeah, so there were horse tribes and they were fermenting mare's milk or horse milk. And they went on this massive conquest, I'm not sure where they were, across Asia, into parts of Europe. And I believe they took this into places like Turkey, Caucasus, Central Eurasia, and those became very ingrained in those cultures. So the grains that you are seeing now, the white ones, the milk kefir, are originally from Caucasus, so the Central Eurasian. And all they are is they're just bits of sugar. Think of it as little bits of sugar joined together like food sugars, not like sucrose. And inside of it is an encapsulation of bacteria. Now think of these bacteria as like little tribes and they all keep themselves safe and healthy. It's what we call a biofilm or an exopolysaccharide. So they keep everything, they keep each other safe. They produce compounds to suppress other bacteria and then they keep propagating, they keep producing this grain, this exopolysaccharide. Yeah, so they just keep this, that film that you see is something the bacteria produces. It's like if I'm standing here and I can make my own house around myself. And that's what these guys are doing. So two types, so milk kefir. And I'll show you how easy it is to make milk kefir. So we've got a kefir maker. These are from Europe, from a, some guys in Slovenia who created this awesome product. And when I first started making milk kefir, it, it becomes really tedious because you're making it every day. So you have to strain it and constantly tend for this thing. And these guys, they made this, it seems like such a simple product, but it's incredibly designed, very well designed. So all you do is you take your milk kefir grains. And that's how they come in a little packet. And the important thing to know is that scientists can't replicate this in a lab. Really? They can't replicate this. They've tried for many, many years. Sorry, I missed that. What's that? So, scientists can't replicate this. Scientists can't. They can't, synthetically. They can't yeah. create the grain. The grain is so complex. It's such a complex thing that only the grains can produce themselves. So if you ever lose your kefir grains, that's the end of your kefir. You have to get some more. <laughs> If you forget about it, like... And just because it happened, it, that it, for, it does for happen. five days, I haven't touched it, and it was ready a long time before that. Yes. So you just rinse it? You could. And start again? Yeah. It, 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 at five days, it's probably just become too fermented. So it's yeah. become really it's strong, strong yeah. and sour. Yeah. But these grains are so strong. I mean, they're resilient. Really, the only thing that can kill them is heat. I mean, they're extremely resistant to acidity and, and pH. So the grains will be perfectly fine, but your kefir probably doesn't taste it good. Do you need to rinse <laughs> so them to revitalize it? Not necessary. The, the, especially with milk kefir, I wouldn't really recommend rinsing, because then you're washing away a lot of the, the bacteria that you've cultured for yourself. And the important thing to note is that the bacteria are very unique to your home. So the culture that you make in there no one else can replicate. It actually becomes very tailored to your household, your pets. Robin will tell you about you know, the interaction between the bacteria. And I think that the bacteria, and this is a concept that I'm toiling with, and James always prompts me on, on technology and, and things that I'm looking at and ideas that I'm, I'm pondering about. And I'm pondering about this, the science of microbial terraforming and this is a science that they're looking at, you know, when we, we move on to Mars and we start to colonize Mars, where we need to terraform that region to sustain life. But I think by making ferments at home, 
you are terraforming your own particular environment. You're creating this environment. Like think about it, an interesting example, if there's any nurses in the room, I'm not sure, any nurses? Nurse, nurse? So one of the most common places for golden staff is a nurse, is a, a, um, is a hospital, right? So what, why is that? Because that whole environment is being terraformed through sanitation where then these resistant strains are starting to prevail. In the same regard, when we make fermented foods, we start to terraform this environment around us with this lactobacilli. And I, I, I actually see it in my fridge. Like, if I leave some vegetables and they, they've gone by a little bit past their use-by date, even we had some chicken in the fridge the other day and I tasted it, it was lacto-fermented. How? Yeah. <laughs> the reason why is because we're making all these ferments and what's happening is the bacteria is spreading all over the house. The whole kitchen is just full of these bacteria. How wonderful is that? That then you're just incorporating it into all your foods. You are microbially terraforming your house to be to create a healthy environment for yourself. It's, it's staggering to me. Fascinating. Do you guys find that fascinating? Yeah, right. <laughs> it's amazing. So that's what I'm pondering about in my spare time at the moment. So how do we make this? It's very, very simple. So we get the grains in here. They're having fun in this packet. I don't want to come out. There we go. And then what we do is I've pre-measured 250 mils of milk. Is it just regular? Just reg regular milk. Regular milk. It's just room temperature. Sorry, it's out of the fridge. Out of the fridge. So refrigerated milk. And then full cream. Full cream. I really recommend in terms of milk sources, A2. So A2 protein is a nice, soft, easy to digest protein. Jersey milk is good, so A2 is the brand. Jersey is just the cow. They both produce A2 milk. It's just the type of casein in the milk. Very, very easy to digest. What about the organic milk that's on the shelves now in the supermarkets? Farmhouse. Farmhouse. My, my suggestion is you, you send a, uh, like a query to the company and just ask them, is it A2? Yeah. Or is it Jersey cows? Yeah. And have you got a qualm with pasteurized or homogenized? That's an interesting question. Yeah. I think, and raw? I think well, r raw milk is now not an option mm -hmm. because they add quinone, which is a is a bittering compound to the milk. So really, in Victoria, we can't get a hold of it. We used to, we used to get bath milk, but now you'll notice if you buy the bath milk and try and drink it, it'll be really bitter. So it's not really an option. Pasteurized is really the only option we have. You can get raw goat's milk if you're lucky. I don't think there's legislation around that. So raw, raw goat's milk is an option. Yeah. I can get raw goats. So you raw goats is fine. Oh. Yep, yep. It's, it's perfectly fine if you get a good source. It's, yeah. it's clean and all that kind of business. Well, now all these organic milks, these farmhouse milks, these other brands coming out, what I suggest is actually ask the company. Because I, I don't really know whether it's going to be an A2 casein in there. So it might well be. The, the, or you can go into the website and just look at the herds. Look at the herds, just make sure it's all Jersey. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's a clarification. Okay. Can yeah. you use other milks right. and dairy? Ex excellent question, excellent question. Can you use other sources of milk, like a, uh, like a nut-based milk, like coconut milk, almond milk? You absolutely can. You can use these grains here. The only thing is the grains won't grow. Because to, to grow, to produce that exopolysaccharide, the house, the grain needs lactose. And you can only get lactose from dairy milk. So that's the only thing. But you still will produce perfectly good kefir from almond milk, coconut milk, perfectly fine. What you could do, interesting strategy that lots of people use, is you alternate. You can go, you know, start with dairy milk, then alternate to almond milk, then back to dairy try cashew, whatever you want to try. So if, if you have a, sorry. Um, yep. It's, some will very clearly brand it. It'll say, it'll say like Jersey milk. Okay. Or others will, like, I think A2 now, the A2 brand is trademarked A2. Yeah. So no one can really use A2. So only they can use the marketing A2. But the, uh, there's still other companies that do Jersey milk. You just have to work out 
from their marketing information, from the packaging, asking the company whether it's actually a Jersey cow. Because they're far more easier to digest than A1. A1 milks are typically more inflammatory, harder to digest, creates more issues. Is that cool? Yeah. Cool. So yeah, so you basically you leave this. I recommend leaving the lid on slightly open. And some, some people will keep it close. It's purely up to you. The only reason why I say leave it slightly open is because it limits alcohol production. So I want to make sure it keep, I keep it low for my customers with children, people who are sensitive to alcohol. If you keep it closed, you get a slightly higher probiotic level. Because when you're keeping it closed, you favor lactobacilli, who are mainly anaerobic. They don't like oxygen. So that's the two strategies you can employ. You're welcome to try both. The textures and flavors will also be very different. So work out what works for you. You know, with any artisanal craft, you know, making ferments is no different. The, the fun and interesting part of it is to play with it and work out what works for you. Everybody's going to be different. You make it in your house, you get a different result to you. It'll be totally different. It's, it's artisanal, it's different, because your household might have a slightly different bug in there, or groups of bugs that are then interacting with your kefir, or maybe you're using a slightly different milk, yeah. or maybe you've got your heating on slightly different to yeah. lovely lady here. Yeah. So you know, temperature, seasons, will also impact the type of kefir that you make. It's, it's, but I, I think that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting because it's always a little bit different. Mm -hmm. It's not like a cookie cutter approach where you get the same thing all the time. It's different. So you start with about five grams and then after around two to three batches, you'll notice it will start to grow. So what I recommend is once you get to around 20 grams, so they'll multiply, you get to around 20, then you start to either take some grains out or you can put more milk. So start to increase the milk ratio. So that's the two things you can look at. Yep. So what happens, right? And that's an interesting point. That was my next thing I was going to cover. So if you look at the lid of the product, right? So if I take this out, you'll see there's two strainers. So you've got one that's small and one that's large. Do I see that? So one, the large one is for milk grains. Sorry, the large one is for water grains and the small one is for milk grains because milk grains are a little bit smaller. So all you're doing now, as you mentioned, sir, is you just pour this. So this is fermenting, say, for one day. Okay, it's ready. Let's make the assumption. On the bench? Or in the on, on the bench on, at room temperature. Then you just pour out what you need. Like I recommend starting, literally, if you're, if you're just starting fermented foods, like a tablespoon. This is a tablespoon because it's so potent. You're talking about billions of bacteria, you know, 100 strains potentially. So your body is going to be shocked by it. If you've never had ferments before, you might run to the toilet, you know, because it's going to shock you. So start slowly. <laughs> it's good to go slow. <laughs> Don't get excited by all this really cool information then. <laughs> Guzzle down buckets of ferments and then get what we call a Herx reaction. And a, and a Herx reaction is, is when the body, when it's overwhelmed, and say if the gut lining is compromised in some way, and then the bugs can actually get through the gut into the blood, and then you get a Herx reaction, and you get diarrhea and all that. So go really slow and get your body used to it. Um, with regard to children, do you recommend them having it and size-wise, like a tablespoon or a teaspoon? Or a teaspoon. teaspoon. Start really slow. You might get a teaspoon into a smoothie and just spread it out and go really slow. And, and allow, allow a good two weeks for the gut to just acclimatize. And you know, and guys, be sensible, listen to your bodies, go slow, ease into it. Because if you're in a state of gut dysbiosis, and gut dysbiosis meaning you've got the wrong types of bacteria in the gut, you're gonna experience potentially a Herxheimer reaction. Now, if you've got leaky gut, you have all these digestive issues, go slowly. And what I recommend with ferments as well, is, is look at a clever gut, guts protocol, gaps protocol first. If you're experiencing IBS, any form of gastrointestinal discomfort where you stand now, before you start to introduce too much fermented foods. 
So that's just a, a little warning. Well, if someone was starting out, for people who haven't had it, you would say start off with that size dose. T teaspoon, a tablespoon, once a day. After a couple of weeks, work up to a cup. A cup a day. A cup a day, I have it with some blueberries, with some honey, which is a nice prebiotic as well. If someone had gut dysbiosis or leaky gut or compromised gut, would you still say to have that one teaspoon? Tiny. It for a longer period. A longer period yeah. and also follow a GAPS or Clever Guts protocol first. And is it pre-meal, pre-food, with food? So the question was like, when's the best time to have it? Is it yeah. before meals, after meals? I think any time. Any time. And what I recommend is you have it raw, just like that, you know, with, with some berries, like with all the, the prebiotics and probiotics and all that business. But also use it in your cooking. Because you know, after a while, you're making 250 mils a day yeah. is quite a substantial mm -hmm. amount mm -hmm. for a small family. It doesn't kill them, the heat? The heat will kill it, yeah. but fortunately, it still produces a lot of benefits. So it's going to pre-digest, say you're making a, a scone, it's going to pre-digest the flour. It's going to produce beneficial, beneficial met metabolites. Mm -hmm. The dead cells themselves also have an impact on the body and the immune system. So I mean, if, you, if you're making a lot of it anyway, you might as well just use some in your cooking, use it in salad dressings. And really, I highly recommend looking up our, our group. It's a free group, it's on Facebook, it's called the Gut Health Gurus. And there's more than 5,000 people in the group. Is anybody on that group, in this room? You're on there? You, you, would, see, you would see all the recipes, right? Yeah. And, and the sharing. Yeah. And this is what people, this is people have been with me for the last you know, five years. So they're all sharing recipes for cooking. People are making coffee kombuchas. They're making anything you can imagine using kefir and kombucha. They are making it and they're sharing the recipes. So it's a great free resource to use. Can I ask Your with question? The, yep. With the milk kefir, does it change the carb count in the milk once it becomes kefir? Yes, absolutely. Because so what will happen is that lactose will get converted to lactic acid. Yeah. So lactose is your sugar. And this is really interesting because this has blew my mind. I always thought lactose was a low GI product. Is anybody familiar with glycemic index and all that? So I wanted to test that theory. So what I did is I connected myself to a continuous glucose monitor. Diabetics use it. So it literally this thing that's stuck on you for seven days. And I found that I always thought lactose was low GI, but every time I was having milk, my blood glucose was doing this. So it's a carbohydrate, but the point is, is that the glycemic index scale is general. It's general. So you look at something low GI and thinking that it's beneficial, it's slightly misleading from my perspective, because I think that the body, your body is individual. Your gut microbiome is individual. Your genes are individual. So whilst some people, and there's a study, the excellent study that came out of Israel, personalized nutrition project that they ran, some people were having ice cream and having no glycemic response. Ice cream is full of sugar. Why are these people not having a glycemic response to this? It's sugar, it's high GI. Some people were having rice, having no glycemic response, or very minimal. Whereas others were just going, straight through the, and this is this is important for you guys glycemic response or insulin production is what triggers the body to store fat so that's another little interesting tidbit for you guys so really pay attention to glycemic response yes ma'am i'll get back sorry. to you in a sec sorry Kevin. so yep. if someone's lactose intolerant yep how do they go with the milk here? yep so what i recommend is using like a non lactose product okay. Typically, the people that I've come across in my community, because the lactose is fermenting out, yeah. some people might fare okay. I mean, it might be low enough to not elicit a response. Mm -hmm. Whereas if, it's, if you're really serious and if you've got casein intolerance, you've got lactose intolerance, try, try using almond milk, mm -hmm. coconut milk, alternate milks. You might even find by going on a GAPS protocol or a Clever Guts, you might heal and seal that lining and yeah. then it disappears. I'm lactose intolerant, by the way. Okay. I have no issue okay. at all. Okay. Good, good question. I would actually recommend washing once a week. So you might, like, a lot of us are busy. We just want quick probiotics. You just pour it, top it up whenever you need to. And then maybe on the weekend, once once a week, just give it a good scrub. Transfer it, 
transfer the grains into a bowl, give it a good wash, get it back in there, start again. But do not wash the grains. Yes. I, I recommend not washing the grains. The only time I would say is to rest or wash the grains is if you're getting some funky taste. Say, for instance, you've somehow, it's, it's transformed to a, a point where you're getting some weird taste, or you're getting, it's over fermenting, it's fermenting too quickly, where the, the bacteria are not balanced enough, then a little hack you can do is just put it into just water, filtered water or spring water, and leave it in the fridge for about two or three days. And what that does is like, it's like a computer, and you're just pressing the reset button, it just resets the culture.